Oh, Shark Tale. What kind of fever dream is Shark Tale? I saw it as a kid multiple times. It was during that phase I had at age 7 in 2004 where I would just pop on a VHS and went to sleep to the sound of it. And so, I've memorized the sound of this movie. But also, can anyone really properly know this movie? Let's find out. It's the terrible Shark Tale. And we begin with this just disgustingly textured worm. Is this seriously 2004? They were trying to do something cool here, the worm coming from the fishing hook of the DreamWorks logo, but it just makes everything needlessly confusing. And after said disturbing worm is established, God, why does it express like that? Why does it have teeth? We come to meet our first shark characters. Hi, I'm Lenny. You know how in the Mario movie we hate everything about actors becoming voice actors who play themselves, but we unconditionally love Jack Black? Well, it's the same here, because that's Jack Black actually performing as a character. Mwah. And naturally, he's not a very good shark. Uh, Lenny, what are you doing? But now that we've established a pretty simplistic character trait and can see where this is going, time for the sharks to exit. Da -da. Da -ba -da -ba -da. <sighs> it's our theme song. W what? Have these sharks seen Jaws? Is this not a copyright infringement? What is this self-referential pop culture humor? Strap in folks, cause this style of humor is 80% of the foundation of this movie. As our Jaws theme cover transitions us over to the South Side Reef, and it is hell. Coral Cola, Gup Fish King? Bloody Fish King? Thanks, I hate it. But with the sharks now gone, the coast is clear for the city. I'm Katie Current, keeping it current. Huh. That was, that was humor. The sharks are gone. Don't worry about a thing. And so the city now comes to life with a non-stop barrage of pretty shallowly written fish puns. That's all it is, fish puns everywhere. Helicopter fish, living with 108 kids, taxi fish, or how's about the celebrity scene that makes no sense? What is happening? Who is Seal? And why does the real Seal look like that? This was made in 2004? How does everything look so gross in this movie? Who molded these faces? Is Muscle Crow an actor? Muscle? Or is he the starfish? I always remembered this movie to be a bit of a fever dream, but I just pinned that down to me not properly perceiving it right as I lolled into the subconscious plane. But no, it's just kind of throwing junk at you at every moment. Here's a prawn shop. Get it? Yeah, it's fake. Fake? I worked eight years on that! It's alright, Muscle Crow. I is that what he looks like in this world? Why is this scene even here? Lobsters are trains! I couldn't even tell you what the pun is there. If there is one. It's gonna be alright! Oh no. I like this joke. I'm being corrupted already, someone help me. And so after that agonizing reveal of the kind of world we're living in for the next 90 minutes, it's time to finally establish our hero of the story. Hi, I'm Oscar. It's Will Smith, in one of his most disturbing forms yet. I don't know exactly what was going on over at DreamWorks Studios, I certainly don't envy the task of trying to personify fish. Although there was totally a Pixar formula they could have followed to a more amicable effect, but this is just not it. Why are there ears just fins? What's with the overly expressive eyebrow muscles and those mouths? Ugh, just look at everybody's mouths! Why did you make this DreamWorks? Why? Fish aren't meant to be vertical. Oh, school. And so Will Smith goes on to cringe off all throughout the scene as he rambles on like a Zelda CDI character about how great it is to live the life of bling bling luxury. Oh god, I hate what this movie is doing to me. Oh, shorties, why y'all messing with my fantasy? And do you see, he's just a level 1 GTA character. Honestly, Grand Fish Auto might have been a more interesting pitch to see play out, but after a stupid scene with this crab and a needless scene with some dripped out kids, I hate my life, Will Smith moves on to his workplace, the whale wash. Well, that's a bit on the nose. Couldn't it have been phrased like carp wash or something? But yes, it's where full on whales come in to be clean, since this grimy reality has everyone covered in grease, green algae and graffiti apparently. Which brings up a point, why is this movie so intentionally dingy? Look at Finding Nemo. It's elegant, smooth, and beautifully blue. 
Here, even in the formal work environment, all the textures are scratchy and scuffed. The coffee machine is dirtied from water damage. I'm not even going to address why the fish has a coffee machine underwater, but it just adds to make the whole scene so unappealing to look at. Never mind the god-awful character design planted within. I'm already punched in. <laughs> Angie. This is Angie. As the sweet name implies, she's the sweet and innocent girl who'll be doting over Oscar despite very few positive character traits throughout the runtime of this movie. Angie needs to get her freak on. Would you hold for one moment, please? Thanks, dog. I hate this guy. Yes, the plotline of this movie will be the one where you're never really rooting for the good guy, as he's just making all the wrong moves, initiating the main conflict, and then is admired for fixing his own problem for once. Great. Oh. Almost forgot. I brought you some breakfast. Oh, it's Kelpie Cream. You know, ironically, Oscar should be making bank on royalties for all these product placements. Anyway, now we come to the sharks of our story, living the Godfather life in a sunken Titanic. Why is this a Godfather movie? As we meet Don Lino, voiced by Robert De Niro, because of course he is, addressing one of his connections and Oscar's boss, Sykes, voiced by Martin Scorsese, because of course he- wait, wait what? The, the director? Mr. Marvel reviewer himself? How on earth did they rope him into this? Anyway, the Don declares that today his two sons will run the reef, and Sykes reports to them now. You know, functional and dysfunctional from before. Sykes disagrees. But Lenny, you can't be serious. I'm that serious. And then the Don fires him. Ha <laughs> ha, get it? Cause they're on the Titanic. Also they try this little delivery gag and I can see what they're going for, but boy it just makes Sykes seem unbearably irritating. Teaching them. You're the best, he's the best, them. right? Am I right or am I wrong? Sykes. Huh? Am I right? To right? Prepa prepare them. Sorry. Yeah, it's all right. And so we're back to Oscar as he actually does a day's work. Sure. It could be a lot worse, you know? I could have this job and look like you. <laughs> you know, it's often a formula that to get audiences on your side, the hero character usually does some good deed at the start of the movie, so everyone recognizes that they're a good person. But this banter is not helping Oscar's case. And no, the Kelpie cream gift does not count. Oh, there it is. He saves headphone guy mid-sneeze. Remember him? Hey, headphone guy. And then when it's a non-issue, goes on to cause a soapy meltdown on the whale client. But it's okay. He sorts it out again. What a day at work. Uh, huh? What would you say, Ash? Uh, okay. Fellas. This is another one of those sounds burned into my long-term memory, and I can't format it out. Anyway, the reason these jellyfish brothers are here is because the plot needs to move forward and Oscar is beckoned to his boss, Sykes. Oscar! Uh, oh, hey, don't sweat it, Sykes. A lot of white fish can't do it. Man. Oscar, would you just sit down? What? I'm not gonna go there. Nothing in this world makes sense. Anyway, with this whole shark thing going on, Sykes needs to pay the Don, so Oscar's 5,000 G debt needs to be paid in 24 hours. You've got 24 hours. You've got 24 hours. You know how this goes. And so Oscar dreams of living life on the top, and Angie just throws away her grandma's sentimentally hand down pearl that's worth exactly five grand to a guy she just has a crush on. And that clears out that conflict. The shark's set of issues though. Lenny not eating meat. You'd think this would have been cleared years ago, but apparently not. So now Oscar has liquidated the pearl into wealth and he now goes on to gabble it all away? I hate this little fillet. And gunning for a million clam reward, look who pops up. Nice bet. Is this problematic? Meet Lola. You can pass her entire personality trait, story, and intention with a single frame. Oscar is head over heels, and then she's away again. Interested before any money's even won. That's bold. Five you had grand. the money to pay me back and you bet it anyway? Hold up, hold Give up. me that! And then the seahorse loses, because of course it does. We have now consistently seen every wrong, immoral move this Oscar guy can possibly make, all because he is obsessed with greed and the goal of living the high life. <laughs> Wait, so all whales are cars and their mouths act as the boot? I mean, I'm glad it's not the alternative, but what? And so naturally, we're given the it's nothing personal, it's just business line as Oscar is soon to be tortured and killed. The end. And as he does, become a member if you'd like to see some early access and behind the scenes to what I do. Or just subscribe if I'm new to you. This is where we're currently at, after all. As for our shark brothers, they're out again as Lenny has to prove himself in one last attempt. Deadhead, you see it? TV dinner. Don't get no easier than this. And so Lenny is forced to go on ahead. You can probably tell where this is going. Huh? And when I turn around, you take off. Oh no. 
Oh, oh. What did I tell oh. you? He he. Ha ha. Oscar has just as many brain cells in his skull as he has morals. Just not really there. But being spotted finally causes Frankie here to snap. Oh. That's it. I've had it up to here. <laughs> The music is building, Oscar is disadvantaged in seaweed, it's time for an action scene. Being chased by a shark, classic. Never mind. <laughs> Literally immediately, we're swooped into a deus ex machina of a random anchor from the sky. No, this never gets addressed. They never even look up. And just like that, Oscar's problems have all faded away. Again, the man who probably deserves it the least in this city. I'm crazy, I'll be driven! And he's stupid annoying too. But with this new opportunity opening up to him, Oscar goes ahead and takes credit for being a shark slayer. Because that could never possibly be a poor decision to make when you live in a city that literally closes down regularly due to the presence of any sharks. If any shark try to mess around in Oscar town, go down! Why would you broadcast this onto the TV? I hate this plotline. And naturally, Lola pops up once again. The town is relieved to finally have something for their shark problem and Sykes even makes a deal to drop the 5,000 Gs to become business partners as the Shark Slayer. You'll never guess where this goes. Meanwhile, the sharks are having their funeral. Remember they were in the sunk Titanic? Well, they're not letting that gag down. It's on the deck of the whole ship and all. And the Don is left grieving as two lost sons. What's wrong with that kid? Why's he gotta be so different? You know, there's a bit of an undertone with Lenny that could easily be seen as really progressive and ahead of its time, but I don't think this movie is smart enough to formulate that. Sure, you could read into this as an expression of being secretly gay and unapproved of, or trans, or something like that, but I think this is just a more generic stroke of otherisms that Lenny has going on. The classic kids movie moral that you should just be yourself. He's giddy and childish, and at most, just not masculine. It's a movie about masculinity. But hey, if this movie did somehow influence for a little bit of self-confidence in some kid after seeing Lenny, great. I think it was a happy accident amongst the rest of this rubbish. Anyway, at this point, the Don learns of the Shark Slayer. Ira, go over here. Sorry. The Shark Slayer. <sighs> here he is! The Shark Slayer! <laughs> My god, this movie will just not give me a break. Just barrage after barrage of crass, in-your-face pop culture. It's like it's trying to cover up for the lack of substance throughout the movie. But it's everything Oscar could have ever wanted. And now he's at the top, it's time for a chat with Angie. Now, I don't forget anything and I never forget who my friends are. Oh. He's ignorant of the romantic subtext. Instead, just returning Angie's sentimental pearl. With interest. Run, Angie, run! This is the best case scenario! Only, of course, for our other romantic interest to pop up now. I'm not interrupting something, am I? No! Yes, we're talking! Uh -uh. And Oscar darts away from there. His desires warped alongside his wealth, but this isn't really a change from how he was at the beginning, let's be honest. Thankfully, Karma is out to get him, since after barely five seconds away from a character with a very, very little depth for us to explore, someone crashes in with... <laughs> Though in any other context, can't they all just stay in place since they're already hidden indoors? Regardless, Oscar is of course thrusted out to face his own lie. Oh! God, I hate this character. And so here are the great whites that were mentioned, just searching for the missing Lenny. And here he is, just lingering over Oscar immediately. But finally, the two meet and chat properly. Lenny distraught over his losses, and Oscar relieved that Lenny is the threat. Even though he's not. But they don't come back. Oh, me like this. Take me home with you. Shh. Shh. I'm there. I'm like the invisible shark. Lenny feels trapped in a corner and just wants to hide from his family, and after Oscar shoos away these rebel kids, Lenny learns of the Shark Slayer title. You're the Shark Slayer! Yeah. Yeah. Shark Slayer? Which to him, of course, is hilarious. You're enjoying yourself? <laughs> well, for your information, I See, I bet Jack Black just did that in the studio one day and they decided to just animate it proper. I actually audibly laughed at this laugh. Anyway, after a mild case of blackmail from Lenny... You wouldn't. I would. Lenny is given refuge in Southside Reef, and Oscar uses this to put down some ground rules. In case you haven't noticed, I'm different from the other sharks. Let's put it that way, leave it at that. And that solves that. Lenny has no plans to eat any other fish, and we're not going to get round to any other ground rules, because that's all that matters. I'm sure he's not stupid enough to just waltz out of here in the middle of the day. Right? Chief Pop knew that. He'd ice you for sure. Was he the godfather or something? 
Yeah. <laughs> I like the delivery. And now all the pieces of our story have finally come together, as Oscar knows just what he's gotten himself involved in. Back at the party now, and there's immediately a video game about Oscar fighting sharks. What is the timeline of events here? And Sykes is immediately in a call with Don Lino, ready for Oscar to answer him. My guys are coming for you, Shark Slayer. They're gonna tear you fin from fin! And naturally, no one is actually listening to Oscar as he tries to plead his case and backtrack out of his own consequences. This movie is just filled with irritating characters and frustrating miscommunications, all in the way of keeping the plot going forwards. Or it's emblematic of a society that cares very little for the plights of a small fry individual against the brazenly fast capitalist environment of the new century, motivated only for oneself and crushing the will of men who do the work over the communal benefits of a society that works to further maintain the unsustainable status quo of this broken system. It's probably not though. This movie not smart. Maybe I can help. And so gold digger Lola pops up again. What could her advice possibly be about helping Oscar get out of this lethal situation for himself? You have worked your way to the top. You don't want to go back to the bottom, do you? It's the same advice as everybody else. Keep going. Show the sharks who's boss and they'll leave you alone. Okay. So Oscar goes over to Lenny. Hello, <gasps> Oscar. Andy. Okay, so I see why the plot might want to go in this direction, but how would she find out plausibly? Why is she going into a random garage? Isn't she the receptionist over at the whale wash? They don't add any kind of explanation as to why she is here or how she caught Lenny. Just the... Your pet shark here told me everything. So I guess we're just going to accept that. Stitchy storytelling. Impressive for a film that's just 90 minutes long. Anyway, Angie is furious that Oscar lied to her. Hey. Don't take it personally. Come on, I lied to everybody. And she too is more pro shark against Oscar's issues. As she's finally got the base point that. I mean, what'd you expect? You just take credit for killing a shark and then everything be fine and dandy for the rest of your life? But after Oscar makes another poor choice in having Lenny play the part of playing near dead and bolstering up Oscar's physique to intimidate the sharks, Lenny eventually turns around with a real plan to go forwards with, as after all, there's a unique way to tackle both of their issues at once. Lenny needs to disappear, and Oscar needs to be a shark slayer. And so begins our faux action sequence as the two fight right out in public. Why is there a Jaws billboard 2 now? Haven't we had enough overt references? And though Lenny is having very brief doubts because this movie needs to hit a runtime quota, Oscar encourages him with You sell this, you'll never have to go home again. You can start a new life! Can't he always do that? Just pick a direction and travel for the rest of time. Whatever. And they resume. Time for the big turnaround and... Are you not entertained? You had me at hello! You can't handle the truth! Does this movie not want to make something original? Is being crass the point? This is an embarrassingly low bar for writing standards. And so, the music cranks back in. This time it's Elvis! As they show off all sorts of new moves against Lenny. Until the final move, the flying fish. <laughs> Full spectacle as the other crowd of sharks witnesses and ending with a final audio screech from the bottom. A nice piece of spectacle for the finale. And you tell Don lame -o. And you ruined it, Oscar. You ruined it. But somehow the intimidation works on a group of hardened mobsters and we move on from there. The town cheers for Oscar's success and after finally making a good move, it's immediately overshadowed by... Hey, low! Has the reef's most eligible bachelor been snapped up? And so naturally, Angie is peeved once again, and Oscar is completely oblivious. At every step, Oscar makes a decent move that someone else dictated. He then takes several steps backwards. I swear, sometimes I want to take your big dumb dummy head and just... <laughs> right. And as the two argue, and we all look at our watch and realize there's about 20 minutes of the film left in this movie, we finally come around to the big twisty romantic beat. Nobody loved me when I was nobody! I did! What a tale. A shark tale. It'll be okay. Uh, they're not putting romantic subtext there, are they? Because that would be a whole different movie of breaking the boundaries of a shark. And so Oscar has reached his sad act, wandering through the reef at night with yet another lyrical song to piece the plot together as he witnesses ad after ad with himself plastered up front. This, I assume, is what life will be like in the metaverse. And as Oscar finally returns to his penthouse apartment, Oscar finally speaks. Angie was right. I am a joke. 
And of course, Lola is here for a chat instead, happy to shoot down Angie's existence and turn to Oscar with... I mean, it's not like you feel the same way about her. <laughs> uh, Oscar, what are you doing? Is that meant to be an expression? This is how you want to demonstrate the internal realization that you do in fact have feelings for Angie? I mean, this could almost be seen as sweet if we haven't watched the entire rest of this movie. And we were blind right now. And so, Will Smith does a 180. You know what? I don't think this is going to work out. <laughs> Now Oscar happy! He got chocolates! It's daytime! The whale wash life is jolly and Angie is missing. Yep, Angie's been kidnapped and Oscar needs to go and save her. And as Letty rambles about how improbable it is, Sykes here learns of all that's been going on because all subtlety has gone out of the window. But hey, at least he did one thing right. This is a joke because, you know, I told Lino... Shut up, Lino! Shut up! <sighs> I honestly thought this was an edit made for the meme, but apparently not. What a diamond in the rough of the rest of this runtime. So with Sykes realizing he'll probably be dead soon too after Oscar, he begs for the shark slayer to be real, to which Will Smith says, I'm sorry Sykes, I'm not. But the sharks don't know that. The solution to all of our problems is to just keep digging yourself deeper, double down on the lie, every time. So here's the meeting with the entire mob. And though the grunts are scared, the big boss man isn't. And which one of you sardines called this meeting? That would be me. And the Don's a pretty stoic guy, just dealing with the loss of his two sons. That'd be pretty horrible, you know? So he reveals Angie on a plate, and after Oscar's pretty immoral bluff... I barely even know that girl. What's your name, miss? Another to add to his collection, of course, our twist villain pops up with... Oh yeah? Well, I say he's bluffing. <gasps> Lola? Turns out her motivations this whole time were to get him killed. I think? Does that explain her behavior? Just a shame everyone else had the same idea this whole movie, so her opinions kind of liquidate into everyone else's as Oscar was pushed down a single, unchangeable track. <laughs> By the way, Lenny's a dolphin now. Pretty bold to bring him back to his family again. Why didn't he leave after the whole faking his death thing again? And right after pulling the intimidation card once again, all the grunts look pretty spooked, and Oscar then goes on again to take things too far, as if we're not already there, already. What is with all y'all living in the love boat, Oscar? Except that somehow doesn't lead Oscar into an immediate chomp of death being so up close. No, instead the Don is just sitting and watching after literally last saying, Your shark slaying days are over. No, instead what it takes is Lenny here throwing up and then he just has to start talking about it. What? Why? This is the worst stitch job for a plot line I think I have ever seen! Me! I couldn't take it. The taste was killing me. Lenny? And so the Don is happy to just see his son alive again. What are you wearing? Huh? What is that? <laughs> and again, you can kind of see some undertones you can extrapolate with this whole cross-dressing sequence, but the Don doesn't linger on it either. More upset about the shark slayer front, and to be honest, you kind of see his point. What did I ever do to you? You took Frankie away, and you turned Lenny into a dolphin! How is the Godfather Shark the most normal person in this movie? What is this movie? I'm gonna get you! <laughs> and so it's time for our action sequence against the dot- Never mind! He's stuck in the window. Thanks, movie. Time for our final scene of the movie as the Don eventually frees himself and they head for the whale wash. Of course, one big machine to capture the giant great whites. The sharks, of course, swimming right through the center as Oscar goes up to the controls. Lenny, what are you doing in there? Sorry. And so the movie tries to keep you entertained as Oscar keeps running forwards and backwards through the same line of this machine. It's not really an attempt at all, really. Until eventually... <laughs> It's over. That was supposed to be entertaining. Thank you for coming to Whale Wash. And Headphone Guy is now unafraid of sharks? <sighs> okay, so Oscar has successfully stopped the Don, doomed to a life of forever running from the mob as they come for revenge for the rest of his life. Or it would be if not for... I am not a real shark slayer! And so, Oscar finally reveals that he lied about everything, and that makes everything okay. And furthermore, he goes straight up to the Don and says, who cares if your son is different? So he likes to dress like a dolphin, so what? A nice message. 
And so the Don just accepts it. Forget even the cross-dressing front, but the idea that THE Godfather will just stop the notion of making his son one of the mob because he was just... asked nicely by some fish is just so... illogical. You can't just ask the Godfather to stop. He's only got one son in his lineage. But he does. And it works. And with Will Smith finally doing one thing right, Angie forgives him for everything. Everything I wanted was right there in front of me the whole time. Okay, yeah. And we end in classic DreamWorks fashion with a city-sized dance party. It's stupid. It doesn't make sense. Oscar somehow also becomes the boss at work. Somehow. And it's just, what am I looking at? Why is this happening? What was this movie again? Is it just a Finding Nemo ripoff? Did the director just really want to make a greeny brown movie? Was I ever supposed to like the protagonist in this movie? Which way are the leg fins meant to be on their bodies? What was it even about? Oh my god. This movie was about the outlets of toxic masculinity within our 2004 society. We already addressed the unmasculine traits of a non-threatening and vegetarian Lenny, but look at Oscar. He represents the breadwinner archetype of masculinity. His value is defined by success and whether he is a somebody or a nobody. He strives to get ahead in this ad field super capitalist society in any way he can and he does so not by suffering the grind of obtaining success but by trying to scum his way to the top as it's the only feasible matter for a working class individual man as disadvantaged as him. And the whole statement of the movie is to just reject the established understandings of masculinity. You don't have to be manly to be respected as a male and you don't need to be on top of the world to have values as a breadwinner man as much as a society may push you down to assume so. You're not a nobody without possessions as you will always find someone who sees you as a somebody regardless. Rebel against the toxic notions of enforced masculinity, be it from your peers or from society as a whole. Now you know what, never mind. I think this was just a big animation test that they forgot to throw out after initial screenings. 90% of jokes flopped, the writing is awful, the visuals are sickening and the references are shameless. We love Jack Black though. This was just a cataclysmic disaster of a movie and I will never get it out of my head. Thanks, tired VHS watching me. That was the terrible shark tale. My name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit.